Okay, Steve, let's uh, let's dive now into Pribham and Bohm. Take it away. Sounds good. So I made a few slides here to help us flow through this thing a little bit more quickly, but obviously the key thing in Bohm is that he's got consciousness as part of the whole movement. And his first stop in uh, discussing this, if we look at the, that, his book, this is all relative to the Wholeness and the Implicate Order book of 1980. His first stop is Prebrum and Prebrum's holographic theory of the brain. And noting that the information in the holographic field is in the holographic field, Bohm asks, is this enfolded structure both of information and matter which primarily enters consciousness? And is information enfolded in the brain cells? And then he quickly goes to Prebrum here. Prebrum has given evidence backing up his suggestion that memories are generally recorded all over the brain in such a way that a given object or quality is not stored in a particular cell, rather the information is unfolded over the whole. So obviously, and implicitly, if not explicitly, he, he Bohm, is endorsing Prebrum's view that memory experience is stored in the brain. And I believe we discussed that in Bergson's model, experience is not occurring solely in the brain and therefore cannot be stored there. The brain is specific to the external environment, the cup out there on the kitchen table, right where it says it is. And that experience is not in the brain. It's being specified out there as part of the past transformation of the field. So, so right away, we've got a problem going with both Bohm and Prebum that we're adhering to the old storage in the brain model, storage of experience in the brain. Um, and then, you know, activating this record that stored the brain, you get a partial experience similar to the original. Uh, but he knows this is complex. Memories from different times are merged with other associations. And he adds other caveats about the complexity of consciousness that we have also, uh, that, I, that we have also awareness, attention, understanding, and perception, all of which is true. Um, this entire notion of um, the uh, partial experience, similar to the original, being restored is uh, part of a, a, quite a discussion I've given on the concept of redintegration, where a present experience has certain pattern or invariance laws that cause the brain to go into a resonant state that become resonant, shall we say, with the uh, a past experience in the 4D extent of being. But that, that of course, is not Bohm's framework here. So going on, oh, actually, I'm symbolizing that redintegration right there. A little, in other words, a, a pattern, a rustle in the grass, it denigrates a uh, past experience of my uh, seeing a snake uh, crawl through the grass and being frightened. Redintegration. But that's what they're re really referring to here but quite a different model between Bergson and Bohm. So this is my complaint. If only Bohm had read Bergson. See, see Prebrum had no model of perception. There is no solution to the origin of the image of the external world. As, as we've got pictured here, as we discussed previously, you know, he had nothing like this where the brain is taken as a reconstructive wave passing through the holographic field, just as the reconstructive wave passes through the hologram plate. Here, the brain is the reconstructive wave passing through the holographic field, and it's specific to a virtual image out there in the field, right where it says it is, the coffee cup and stirring spoon with a buzzing fly going by, namely uh, a certain scale of time being specified to a buzzing fly as opposed to a heron-like fly or a cloud of electrons. So as we saw, that's, that's Bergson's model. But the implication experience, as I noted, is not certain occurring solely within the brain, therefore it can't be solely stored there. So note that Bohm is storing not only objects, but qualities in the brain. So how any architecture, computer or brain accounts for the quality of experience, this is exactly the hard problem as Chalmers framed it, but neither Bohm nor Prebum shall we say, we're really aware of the problem at the time either. It just hadn't really 
filtered into people's consciousness yeah, in 19. It, it didn't exist yet, generally. Yeah, 1972 for Prebum and Languages of the Brain, 1980 even for Bohm for Wholeness and Implicate Order. So uh, obviously, then they didn't get the understanding, or the, as I would put it, that the more general problem is how you explain the origin of the Im image of the external world, which is just there's nothing in the external image, as we noted, that's not quality, including all the forms, the dynamically changing form. So, as I noted, before Bohm lay this apparently obvious step, namely, explain how the explicit order that is our image of the world, the coffee cup out there, the fly going by, is unfolded by the brain from the implicit order of the whole of field, at least say, this is how problem is the question, but he never does. Not, not, not even after Gabor, holography, et cetera, which he had the benefit of, uh, which to me, by the way, is just highlights how incredible Bergson's 1896 insight actually was. Absolutely, yeah. Well, anyhow, that was kind of the major uh, uh, complaint I have with, with Boom, if you just would have looked at Bergson and said, boy, yeah, it's a holographic feel and the brain is essentially the reconstructive way. That would be how the explicit order is unfolded. That, that would have been cool. Well, another thing in Boom that's difficult is time. So here's a quote. When we think of movement in terms of the implicit order, however, these problems do not arise. In this order, movement is comprehended in terms of a series of interpenetrating and commingling elements and different degrees of enfoldment, all present together. The activity of this movement is an outcome of this whole enfolded order and is determined by relationships of co-present elements rather than by relationship of elements that exist to others that no longer exist. This, he says, allows, allows us to reconcile the abstraction with the, actual, with the actual experience of movement. We see what is movement, he says. So again, he says, rather than the traditional and confused view relating what is to what is not, we are always dealing with a certain phase of what is, that is, to other such phases. So this, this is, one has to admit, is very consonant with Bergson's indivisible flow of time, where each instant quote unquote permeates and interpenetrates the next where each present instant is not falling instantly into the past it is into non-existence in other words you can get this kind of co-present together uh, time extent of quote unquote instance which uh that that bohm is uh discussing and that you don't have this notion he's, he's decided denying that uh you actually have instants that fall into the past into non-existence that is that last phrase there that exists to others that no longer exist that is you know in the standard model of of uh time the abstract space four-dimensional space of the classic metaphysic as we discussed earlier the present moment is the only moment that exists all all previous instants have fallen into non-existence, which we symbolize by the past. Mm -hmm. And in Bergson's model, along with Bohm, well, that they do not continue to, they do not fall into non-existence. Right. They're all there in some, in some mode. And right, and right there, let's let's comment on that. They're there in some mode. So for Bohm, are we saying? Well, they're yeah, they're they're there in a sense that. The, the flow of time, the, ch the change of the dynamic transformation of the matter field, as I've been saying, is indivisible. Each moment into penetrating and permeating the next. Uh, so you've got a four dimensionally extended transformation. And uh, so that that mode is precisely, the, I don't know how to put what mode to call it, other than it's the transformational mode of the universe. But it always but here's another always, interesting part. Go ahead. There, the issue is like, what's the glue? You know, I mean, um, I've always it's felt that for Bohm, the glue is the implicate order, whereas for Bergson, I don't know what we, we call it memory or we call it. Well, the, the, yeah, the, the glue is time itself. Right. The very right. nature right. of time right. is the glue. 
Gotcha. You know, and that's that's why we were, like, we were just discussing before we got started that, you know, um, the motion of time, mo the motion of the matter field itself is memory, right. in reality. The tra time transformation of the matter of the matter field, the very change of the material universe is memory, uh, right. and the way around that. But uh, interesting quote here from Bohm: At a given moment. This is, this is the interesting musical uh, metaphor that he uses. At a given moment, a certain note is being played, but a number of previous notes are still reverberated in consciousness. Close attention will show that it is the simultaneous presence and activity of all these reverberations that is responsible for direct and, and immediately felt sense of movement, flow, and continuity. To hear a set of notes so far apart in time will destroy altogether the sense of a whole unbroken living movement. So again, we're very close to Bergson's, you know, when, when, when he views the motion of time the, and the best metaphor for it being the notes of a melody, where if you take notes as equivalent to instant, each, each uh, note slash instant interpenetrates, permeates the next, and each present note is a reflection, the state of that present note, the sense by which we feel it is a reflection of all of the other previous notes. Like you get uh, you know, certain, um, you know, some state of a, a point in a symphony where a certain chord or sound is played where its entire significance is relative to that whole preceding period of symphony, but more simply, in a shorter time frame, twinkle, twinkle, little star, twinkle, twinkle, little star, all you have to do is hold one of the notes longer than normally to destroy the melody. Uh, so he's, you can see he's we're very close, uh, in a sense, to, to, to Bergson. Uh, and yeah, to hear a set of notes so far apart in time, it is again in the twinkle twinkle little star phrase phrase analogy you could destroy the whole uh, recognition of twinkle twinkle little star just by altering the, the time flow so he says how a sequence of notes is enfolded into consciousness and of how at any given moment the transformations flowing out of many such enfolded notes interpenetrate and intermingle to give rise to an immediate and primary feeling of movement. So, again, it, it's so close to Bergson, uh, but there's a, a little bit of a disturbing subtone here in that, you know, it's, it's as though you have to have this impenetration and intermingling to give rise to the movement, but, but it is the, you know, you're experiencing the movement. It is, we don't need to go into that, but I, I just think there's a a little bit of a, a subtext here that is perhaps going off in the wrong direction. So he says, at a given moment, a certain note is being played, but a number of previous notes are still reverberating in consciousness. Close attention will show that it is the simultaneous presence and activity of all these reverberations that is respons responsible for direct and immediately, sense of moves, immediately felt sense of movement, flow, and continuity. To hear a set of notes so far apart in time, well, I guess we read that already. Oh, no, I guess not. Well, let's throw altogether the sense of a un whole unbroken living movement. So he, he notes this concept that consciousness can be described as a series of moments. A moment covers a somewhat variable extended period of duration and is experienced directly in the implicate order. He declares this closer to Whitehead's occasions as opposed to Leibniz's and his, mo his monads. Okay. So the problem here is that this focus on extents like occasions or epochs and also in Whitehead's terminology uh, we just really don't need that notion of moments with extents when considering, the, say, the perception of a flow field or the rotating cube being taken as a you know, series, a set of partition set of flows. Again, that rotating cube, the, 
the uh, as the t side rotates towards you, you've got a expanding flow field as it rotates away, a contracting flow field, or the or the uh, the road, the, the transforming velocity flow field. Okay, how do you partition that into a set of epics or moments? Right. Okay. See, uh, now, Steve, this yeah. I wanted to bring this up, and maybe we can build on this later if we have the space and time. But this kind of does tie into Capic, and I'm I'm just obsessed with his notion of the pulsations, you know. So what I think what we're saying here is this notion of moments with extents is kind of like what a guy like Capic would call a pulsation, right? Right. Yeah. Yes. And I didn't. Yeah. I never got back to you on on that. I don't think, or, or, or unless I did. But yeah, I yeah, I'm not a fan of that pulsation right. thing because and it's because like when it comes down to trying to actually define how how would you define a pulsation it, yeah. it's going to become very arbitrary and and you know very well, unprincipled let me just say first off you're the only person i've ever come across who is not in favor of that notion of pulsations all the other bergson scholars i've read seem to be somehow trying to integrate let's say bergson and whitehead or now bergson right. and Paul. yeah but but and that, that's to me is a really really key piece is because in my mind steve and we can talk about this later <laughs> maybe but it, it's come it comes back to the notion that bohm had this notion of a generative order right from which the pulsation could unfold from right right so, so that's what and, and and of course he's looking at things quantum mechanically as kind of right like, you know and so in my mind, there is a way to stitch Bergson and Bohm together, but it has to do with this notion of viewing, let's say, Bergson's duration as itself a generative order in the sense that Bohm used it. Right. And but then well, that yeah. kind of rotation. So <laughs> I'm kind of right. Struggling. Right. Well, yeah, we have to remember and we're gonna get there. I think I have that in the slide with you know, he's trying these to uh, reconcile you know, the quantum mechanic notion of jumps, you know, yeah, which are yeah. pulsations yeah. into a coherent notion of the motion and flow of time. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And uh, yeah, it, we it's a good try. And I, I thought about it for a long time too, until I, I you know, in fact, uh, you know, Sch Schrodinger, uh, as we'll see the 1952 article, you know, where he says, where he just denies that there are quantum jumps. Is, right. See, that's it's really intellectually freeing. <laughs> <In reality. laughs> yeah, it is. And, and, and Bohm was very, he wouldn't do that. He, he stuck to, he stuck. To, I guess he uh, didn't read Schrodinger's article. No, nah, I mean, he, he I, you know, in his literature, if you read the letters he's written to individuals that were published after his death, he, he did struggle with uh, Schrodinger, just the whole, the whole thing. So, because yeah. as you know, you know, he, he was always committed to trying to, in some way, integrate relativity in, in quantum mechanics, which he never did. Right. It's another problem. Yep. Anyway, let's see what we got here. Hmm. Yeah. So I said, and from whence does the extent or extended period? So I mean, again, I'm just questioning. Well, how do you get the pulsation out of a, out of a flow field? I, I got. You. Yeah. That's that's. that's um, you can sort of almost get a sense of a pulsation from that rotating cube, but... Um... But you see, Steve, this comes down to the notion that, like, for Bergson, the what Bohm would call the explicate order is itself holographic. There's no need for an implicate order, whereas Bohm, there is that need for an implicate order from which something could emerge or unfold. It comes down yeah. to that. It comes down to that. You know, Bergson's holographic field, as you see it, is part of what Bohm would call the explicate order. There's no need for a generative order. And that is just yeah. fascinating to me. <laughs> right, it's interesting. And, and I, I think if we explored it more, I mean, the whole notion of becoming in Bergson uh, would be contrasted to how Bohm thinks the right. universe evolves. It'd be an right. interesting right. question. Right. Yep. But my mind starts to boggle. <laughs> Let's go on here. Oh, yeah. Even yeah, I noted even even the discrete icons, which seem like discrete sampling of a scene, are, are and as Burke as Gibson points out, in actuality, it's picking up flows. Right. You know, the eye isn't picking up snapshots; it's picking up flows as a, a as a, it's 
sampling across the flow of that of that field. Yep. Yeah, we can't get rid of Homer as long as you're looking at the view. Okay. So and as I said, theorists love, maybe it's noted, love the moments, the occasions, the epochs. They're always vague, impossible to precisely define. The utility is, I've never seen a use for them. Okay, again, back to perception and boom, um, in general, not just prima. Why and you know those how why and how we see rotating cubes, fluttering butterflies, falling leaves. He says it is not necessary to go into the question of how in consciousness the explicit order is what is manifest. Okay, which was my complaint. Well, why didn't you just say it's been unfolded via the reconstructive wave? So he says, noting that manifest equal that which is recurrent, stable, and separable, he goes on saying that observation and attention show, quote, the manifest content of consciousness is based essentially on memory, which is what allows content to be held in fairly constant form. Of course, to make possible such constancy, it is also necessary that this content be organized, not only through associations, but also with aid of rules of logic and basic categories of space, time, causality. In this way, an overall system of concepts and mental images may be developed, which is a more or less faithful representation of the external world. So, oh, oh darn. Well, let's go back to that uh, quote. That more or less faithful representation of the external world is precisely his declaration of or vote for indirect realism. Right. We're not seeing the coffee cup out there on the table where it says it is. We've got an internal image somewhere in a mental space, a perceptual space in the brain, uh, anywhere but in the physical universe, apparently. And that's what we're seeing. Right. And and then there's other comments to make here. I hope I, I, I get to them because there's in this quote here, there's some uh, confusing or conflation of various sophistications of consciousness, various sophistica sophistication or cognitive developmental levels of consciousness. I I, obviously, I can I can perceive the coffee cup out there, okay. Then I can perceive it in such a way that I, I remember it. I, mean, I remember having uh, dr drunk. I had, had a coffee with at the coffee shop with my wife a week before and precisely locate that experience in time relative to the, the time I'm in, which is a question of explicit memory. I can and and uh, I can re even remember and recognize that, you know, Juan Valdez in Brazil has had something to do with bringing the coffee to me. But all, I mean, but that's all way beyond just the dynamic specification of the brain right as a reconstructive way with a coffee cup out there so he's getting way more into uh cognition than he realizes and, and memory yeah i agree so i'm as i'm going to say this is not what that quote was was a theory of perception there's no actual model of unfolding the explicit from the implicit order of the whole of field again a reconstructive wave is the method of unfolding the explicit from the implicit order of a hologram. If you take implicit order as remembering that that hologram plate there up in the red box of the in the corner has a interference pattern uh, imprinted on it that looks nothing like the uh, coffee cup or the pyramid and ball. Uh, so it's implicit in that sense, and that is his, his model, but but the object wave, the original object waves or source are unfolded by the reconstructive wave into their explicit form, the pyramid and ball, the coffee cup. So, you know, again, for Berkson, it's the brain, the dynamics of the brain, and it's the reconstructive wave. So Bohm, as we noted, is simply an indirect realist. That is, perception is not direct. We're not seeing objects and events within the field Right where they are specified, right where they say they are. All is simply a representation based on memory and memory images, which, as we noted in the beginning, he doesn't know how 
they're stored in the brain in the first place. You, you can't store your memory images in the brain. There's no there's no coffee cup in the brain. There's, uh, there's, there's no pyramid and ball in the brain, etc. But again, you've got some mysterious one-to-one -one correspondence with the reality, a magical, that, mystical that, correspondence. I just have to say, this is because he aligned himself with Pribram, which he didn't need to do. He didn't need to do that, but somehow, you know, they became friends, they got close, and he went with, he, he would say to people, oh, Every, anytime someone asked him about uh, uh, perception, or he said, "Don't go talk to Pribram." So he did. Right. Well, their... yeah. Obviously, Pri Pribram was the supposed authority on perception yeah. and memory in the brain, you know, and so he was being, um, you know, respectively, uh, right, uh, respectful of, of uh, Pribram and Pribram's subject matter. Uh, just like Bergson tried to be respectful of Einstein and the physicist, you know, uh, was very respectful. Let's see where we are. Oh, yeah. So, in other words, this is this is um, uh, bone. That is, we we've got the indirect representation somewhere in some mystical space, the cloud somewhere in perceptual space, as uh, Joshua Bach likes to call it, or something like that. And that's nice one-to-one -one correspondence with reality. So the reliance on memory images and construction of the external world is further emphasized here. One, one can in fact deduce a considerable amount of evidence showing how much of our conscious experience is a construction based on memory and organized thought. Well, that's true. You know, being a student of Piaget, uh, Bohm notes, he, that it takes a while to develop the concepts of concepts of causality, object, space, and time. I'd like to summarize it as cost. Um, and the child initially relies on sensory motor experience, the, the implicate order being more immediate and direct. Remember the music example. So um, all this is true, but again, you're 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 talking as as I noted with. You know, it, in the child's case of cognitive development, you're, uh, and the d development of those concepts, which take a couple of years, because all the object space and time, uh, you're you're now developing how you can see the coffee cup as an experience that's related to an experience that you had a week earlier drinking coffee with your wife in a, your favorite coffee shop. But you can locate an object or an event in the past explicitly. Uh, and that's now part of your perception, but it's not the fundamental uh, problem of how that co coffee cup on my table being stirred happily is specified in the first place. He's, he's, he, 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 gets con he, he, he just gets things confused here as to, in terms of the basics versus the much more uh, developmental stage along the way, gotcha. more, more sophisticated development. So you know, it's the explicit, explicit order requires a complex construction that must be learned. Well, no, the explicit order is the coffee cup on the table, out there being stirred, being specified by the brain as a reconstructive way. It doesn't require a complex construction to be learned. And only if you're taking that event in a, in a, as a nested event, specifically understood as related to something in the past or some other conceptual framework as you're putting it in. See what I'm, you see yeah. where I'm going with that? Yeah. It's a representation for him. That's what it is. Right. Right. And so he's conflating a whole lots of things here with, and, which is my comment. This is on it just a bit confused. As I noted, the frog is seeing an explicit fly. An object, an object in motion, his perception is unfolded from the holographic field. He doesn't need to spend two years learning causality, object, space, and time, you know, to see that fly. Uh, the chipmunk, same thing. He's chewing on an explicit peanut. The child is playing with, ex with an explicit toy perceived within the holo field. You, you don't need this two years of cognitive development to do that. You need it for other things, yes. Now, Bergson certainly does not deny the role of memory in past experience, and 
I'll say cost, causality, object, space, time, and, and present perception. But Bohm's lack of any theory of perception ends with spreading a complete mist over the fundamental problem of the origin of the external image. He's just, he's just taking us into realms that are irrelevant to the initial problem, which is basically the origin of the image of the external world, unfolding that from the whole field and, and uh, with all its qualia, because it's all part of the hard problem, obviously, because it's a qualitative dynamically changing whole of field that's part of which is being specified as a coffee cup or a fly buzzing by. So a little bit more, more on time again involved. He would, he marshals more thoughts on showing his total order of matter and consciousness. Uh, these may be fine, but the solid base is just not there. He now relates this all again to time. He begins by noting that in special relativity, time may vary according to the speed of the observer. He knows what is important is special relativity is fusion of space and time. And he says, since quantum theory implies that elements are separated in space, are elements that are separated in space are generally non-causally and non-locally projections of a higher dimensional reality, it follows that moments separated in time are also projections of this reality. So moments separated in time are also projections of this reality. So here we're going to get to this attempt to account for quantum jumps, quantum moments jumping to other quantum moments, shall we say, instant. And he, he never breaks from these mythologies of special relativity, that time may vary according to the speed of the observer. Never, never breaks from STR or uh, the notion of quantum jumps, ever. Nope. Thus he argues time has lost its primacy. Like space, it must be considered a projection of a higher dimensional ground with many, with many orders of time. Indeed, one can further say that Many such particular interrelated time orders can be derived from different sets of sequences of moments corresponding to material systems that travel at different speeds. Well, this is the problem. Time does not change as a function of velocity. This is uh, he, he probably he needed to read Bergson's duration and simultaneity too. I know that to the, our audience, this is probably this statement is probably a jaw dropping, flabbergasting <laughs> statement that time does not changes a function of velocity. And it's a subject that, uh, you know, yeah, you and I wanted to go into, but I don't know if we're going to be able to. Well, I just, I just want to say into your, your treatment of a, a, the special theory of relativity, for instance, you, you hear you refer to 8A and 8B, you're referring to your YouTube lectures. 8A. Right. You, you do a fabulous job critiquing uh, the mythology around relativity. So so yeah, this he, yeah. yeah, if he, oh. and Bohm just he needed to get through that, but he did. So further, like Bergson's transforming kaleidoscopic whole, and I think we talked about that a, a bit. You know, where Bergson said, "Yeah, all of relativity." Uh, one can ask, well, how, how do I know what object is in motion and which, what object is at rest? Uh, but in reality, that's sort of an invalid question because you, you're identifying separate parts in the whole as though they had a reality when in fact, it's the whole that's changing as though it were a kaleidos kaleidoscope in his metaphor. The whole is changing and now, the, the motions of objects become changes or transfers of, transferences of state, you know, like waves in an ocean, in, in an ocean uh, within the whole. And, and so from that perspective, there's real motion. You know, I, as I noted before, roses blooming, mountains arising, couch potatoes getting horribly fat, et cetera. There's, there's real motion in the universe. And it's 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 it, that real motion implies real simultaneity, and and actually the kaleidoscope changing is a is actually a, a simultaneous change across the entire universe. So um, it's interesting because in Bohm's model of the turning glycerin symbol, where the ink drops come out 
one by one by one um, uh, as simultaneous wholes, he's really destroying the relativity of simultaneity in the transforming matter field. That is, his glycerin symbol is a whole turning and out coming these little, little particles. So he admits that his glycerin symbol is, uh, I mean, sorry, his, his, his uh, cylinders with the glycerin embedded between two surfaces of the cylinder is, is uh, he doesn't like its mechanical implications, kind of wants to drop it because of course, it starts to go against other things he thinks are relevant in physics, but, um, but as I'm uh, looking at my last sentence there, the, if, if you're destroying the relativity of simultaneity, there's nothing possible left of special relativity. It, it should be dropped, but he can't go there. But, you know, I just want to say something about the kaleidoscope there. I think he would like that as a metaphor, you know, the whole. It's, it's a, mm, yeah. yeah. But, but, but yeah. I think we could, if you bring Bohm into this, I, and I share this, <laughs> and know, it's almost as if that kaleidoscope is a pulsating kaleidoscope. For exactly. Yeah. That's what yeah. I, I was going to say. But he would say that kaleidoscope is a series of quantum jumps, yeah, jump yeah. after jump after jump after jump. Yep. You know, yep. Yep. and Bergson was saying, no way. That's the difference you know? right there. Yeah. Yep. You know, it's interesting though that Bergson never actually addressed the quantum jump problem, but I don't, I don't know that. And that, that was around before he left the planet, you know, I think. Uh, uh, nineteen twenty-seven or so, yeah, it was still died hanging around. Yeah. yeah, yeah. He just never addressed it. He, he might not have known what to do with it, you know. Yeah, um, too bad too, by the way. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Would have helped me. Me too. There's some more real motion, the organically going tree that can't be relativized. You can't actually relativize such a motion without destroying the organic. Uh, growth, yeah, the tree would fall apart. So anyhow, he goes on. Similarly, similarly, we are led to propose that this multidimensional reality may be projected into many orders of, of sequences of moments in consciousness. Again, we're back to the moments in consciousness, not sequences of moments. Not only do we have in mind the relativity of psychological time, it goes on. So remember, he's got his fish tank model where uh, different views of the fish are being projected depending on what, you know, whether, which, which camera you're looking at, facial view of the fish or um, the side view of the fish, but in reality, it's one fish, it's one of his models. So he's, you know, he said, the fish motions of each 2D fish are mysteriously correlated. We've got this higher dimensional reality Maybe the fish in the tank that's being projected down into a lower dimensional reality, et cetera. Or a little model up there of the what it looks like if you're a flat, if you're a flat lander living on that plane, uh, you've got an expanding circle in that plane, but in reality, it's a three-dimensional ball going through the plane. If you were able to look at it from a higher dimension. So he's sort of thinking along these lines, noting how two friends can meet after a long period in it. And it seems like no time has passed. He states, we are proposing that sequences of moments that skip are just as allowable forms as time as those that seem continuous. There you go. So I would say he's really getting into the weeds here. I mean, bad weeds. Because he's he's just trying to to to, to deal with quantum jumps. Yep. And the fundamental law then is that of the immense multidimensional ground. And the projections of this ground determine whatever time orders there may be. So, I mean, so he's visualizing this ground, which, by the way, has to be continuous. I mean, at some point, you're going to, you're going to have a continuous generator of events, but your continuous generator of events can can generate things as the movie uh, uh, slider or uh, What's, the, what's the movie screen after movie screen, screen after snapshot after snapshot, screen after screen, 
And, and obviously, he just as well. And by the way, it could it could present a picture of you when you were one, and then jump to a picture of you when you're ten. You know, and that's that's allowable too, because this higher dimensional ground can project anything it feels like at any time. So, so what we're saying okay. is, are we saying here that the multi dimensional ground multi dimensional ground is the hollow movement, right? And for him, time is in the hollow movement. That's the issue with Bohm, right? For you, right? It's because well, yeah, Ferguson, but but then again, his, his multi dimensional his multi dimensional ground does that is that come and go in discrete jumps too? What's creating the discrete jumps? See, now you're back to Descartes, you know, looking at the discrete state model of time, where each instant of time would correspond to a, uh, say, a visualizing a cube of the universe. The universe is a big cube, instantaneous cube. You have cube one, then you have cube two, then you have cube three. The problem is, you know, they're frozen cubes. You can't get from cube one to cube two unless God creates cube two. Right. Cube two disappears, but now you have to have God create cube, cube, cube three. I mean, that was, Descartes literally said, well, this is where you would need God to create the universe over and over and over again. Well, who's creating the multidimensional ground if it's, an, it's a, if it's a discrete state multidimensional ground? I mean, you know, it, so, so, uh, it, all, it all goes back to these absurdities. Unless, as Bergson said, motion is primary, end of story. You know, you're always led back to movement being but, the fundamental thing. But, that, but that's confusing to me. But so Baum is also saying that motion is primary because for him, the hollow movement yeah. is primary. So it's, yeah, it's, but see, but you see in the, <laughs> yeah, he, he, yeah, but, but, uh, yeah, I guess the hollow movement would be primary, but. Um, and it includes time. Time unfolds from the hollow movement. So it's it's upside it's upside down with Bergson. Bergson time is primary, and for Bohm order. Yeah. Primary. See that's the difference. Right. I think. Right. Bergson is grounded right. in time, and Bohm is grounded in order, and that is a fundamental difference. I think so. Um, I think we're getting to the. Oh, anyway. but you know, my little comment here. But Schrodinger, 1952. Are there quantum jumps? He ruthlessly disproved this continuous jump conception. Yeah, nobody knows that. And I just, I just think he ripped the ground off from under. Yeah, but nobody, nobody talks it. about this though. Nobody talks about that fifty-two paper. No, nope. no, 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 because the because this mythology of the quantum jumps and uh, all these other sure quantum thingies is so uh, mystically mysterious and fun that. Uh, it's interesting. Not that Bergson isn't myster plenty mystically mis mysterious and fun, but <laughs> uh, just a different form. Anyhow, that, yeah, I, um, in my videos at number 60 for anyone right. watching, listening. Again, you, you got to get this. Where do the dimensions come from? His, his cylinder is his only concrete model. He's a a system of n particles is a th three n dimensional reality. So if I've got four particles, three times four, I've got 12 dimensions. That's just, you know, five, I got five particles there coming out of a cylinder, but I need 15 dimensions to do that. That's quite an interesting little cylinder. Okay. Imagine the number of dimensions required for all the particles in the matter field. And what actually are these dimensions other than just plain abstract mathematics? So this is where his model sort of crashes into the concrete wall of concreteness, <laughs> shall we say. Okay, let me go back to, uh, before I do this picture. So I think that's our, well, that's our, that's all I had to uh, say about Bohm. Okay. okay. I think we said enough though. Well, yeah, you know, we there's a lot there, and I I want to say that I think any scholar of Bohm or any Bohm fan needs to, for instance, watch your number sixty. You just mentioned the one on Schrodinger and the quantum jumps. That's so crucial for people to understand. And then what you say about special relativity and eight A and eight B, uh, that needs to be right. because, as you said, Bohm definitely drank the Kool Aid with regard to special the special theory. Right. right. 
and he and he never let go of the quantum jumps. And uh, you gave us good food for thought. Right. I, I would recommend the one I did on Whitehead too for number oh, yeah, 53, fifty-three. Because there you there you're looking at the notion of epochs yeah. or these moments, etc., and how that just starts to fall apart. And Whitehead's solution to the relativity problem, quote unquote, I say solution in quotes, because it's instructive that, again, it, it uh, gets destroyed by, by Bergson's analysis. So uh, and interesting, and, and it, that's very, that's a more even succinct thing in A to A and A B on, on relativity, if you want I that, agree. I, I, I um, agree. And, where, and where it collapses. Yeah. All right, so you wanna, you wanna bring this to a close for now? Yeah, we can do that. All right. Let's do that. Signing off then.